Good morning. Uh, my name is Joe Doherty. I'm the Public Information Officer for the Utah Department of Public Safety. Um, today is the briefing for Thursday, July 9th, 2020. We will start with Dr. Angela Dunn, the State Epidemiologist in the Utah Department of Health. Uh, she will be followed by Governor Gary Herbert. Okay, good afternoon. We now have a total of 27,356 cases of COVID-19 in Utah. That is an increase of 601 from yesterday. And we've tested 388,733 Utahns for COVID-19. But we're now at a point in this outbreak where it's more meaningful to look at the seven day trends of cases and percent positives of all of our tests. This allows us to really identify meaningful trends in our data and it decreases the noise from this day-to-day -day fluctuations we're seeing. So looking at our seven-day rolling average for positives, we have a seven-day rolling average of 585 cases per day and 9.9% positivity. We've seen an increase in cases in our ages 15 to 44 years. And, and this could be the reason for our drop in hospitalizations and case fatality rates. 6.2% of our cases have required hospitalizations, and that's compared to 8% earlier in this outbreak. And our case fatality rate is now 0.75% compared to 1% earlier in the outbreak. While this is encouraging, all ages should continue to physically distance when possible, wear face masks, stay home when you're sick, and wash your hands. The more cases we have in our community, regardless of the ages of the cases, increases the risk to our vulnerable populations. And we all need to do our part to control the spread of COVID-19 in Utah. I'd like to briefly touch on the Healthy Together app and some changes that are occurring. So this app has been in place for now three months and we've been able to really understand how individuals are using it and the utility to our response. 58,000 Utah residents have downloaded the app and they're mainly using it to assess their symptoms and be referred to testing. Users have completed 500,000 symptom assessments and 18,000 individuals have been referred to testing. We've learned over the course of the past three months that location tracking isn't popular, and as a result, it hasn't really been helpful to our contact tracing efforts. So for that reason, we are gonna be turning off GPS and Bluetooth location tracking. Those components of the app will no longer be there but the app will continue to be an important part of our response. It's a great way for individuals to be able to assess their symptoms, be connected to testing, receive their test results, and also get information about what they should do next to protect themselves and their loved ones. We hope these changes to the app will encourage more Utah residents to download and use the app in order to prevent spread of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Dunn, as always. We appreciate your insights, and uh, we really appreciate the service you've rendered to us over these past number of months and help us guide us through this challenging time. Um, I think your expertise has really helped with our unified command uh, as we've worked together to try to bring all uh, stakeholders together with expertise that they have, uh, input, uh, different points of view, and trying to give us a united effort to respond to this coronavirus. So uh, we are a state of 3.2 million people. And as I observe that, we have a lot of people that have different points of view on this issue. Not surprising, we have different points of view on many issues. Our different backgrounds, uh, different philosophies, different politics. But one thing we've done very well in the past is that we've worked together in a, a spirit of collaboration and cooperation. And as I look at this pandemic, uh, that culture that we have here in Utah is needed now uh, more than ever. The ability for us to work together for the common good, the desire for us to, in fact, find ways to solve the problem. 
and uh, recognize it's not just about us, but it's about the people we live with here in the state of Utah. Um, this pandemic uh, has really been a unique situation we've never seen really uh, in Utah, certainly in the last hundred years. Uh, it's uh, the curveball of all curveballs that have been thrown at us, impacted our way of life, our economy, uh, what we typically would be doing uh, with our social lives, with our families, uh, you know, it's just impacted every aspect of it. And um, there are parts of this that, uh, you know, we need to work better on as far as disagreement. Again, I know there's different points of view, but one thing we should not disagree upon, and that is the desire and need we have to protect people's lives, the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens here of Utah, 3.2 million people, but also the need at the same time to make sure that our economy stays functioning. It's a big, important aspect, and by polling, we have now a situation where people are more concerned about their livelihood than they are the health of the, the state as a whole. So again, these are not mutually exclusive ideas. Uh, in fact, they are joined together at the hip. Uh, we need to stay safe to stay open stay safe to uh, hopefully corral the spread of the coronavirus in order to have a healthy growing economy. They do work together in concert. Let me, if I could, uh, just make a few observations here pertinent to where we find ourselves as a state today. Uh, one, the culture of Utah is one that's fairly unique in that we, in fact, for the last 13, 14 years, have led the nation in volunteerism. We actually do help our neighbors. We go out of our way to find uh, those people in need and see what we can do to give them a helping hand. That's been recognized by national publications and certainly those of us who live here know that's part of our culture and way of life. We also lead the nation when it comes to charitable giving, taking of our own resources, and donating it to those who are less fortunate and have a need. Uh, that tells me that the people of Utah really do care about their neighbors. They care about their family. They care about their neighbors. And when I say neighbors, those that they know and those that they don't know, those who reside in their town or community or across the state. And certainly they care about the people of America, and they show it by their actions. I think as a state, uh, and as a people, we did very well the first three months of this coronavirus. It got to us here in Utah really the first part of March. For those next three months, we had people that really sacrificed. Uh, we had a plan that we put in place that uh, kind of told us what we should be doing, and, and we had to stay safe, uh, stay home to stay safe. Uh, we, did, we restricted travel. Uh, people sacrificed and, and curtailed a lot of their activities to adjust to see if we could bend the curve on the infection rate. We were at about five, we bent the curve down to about four, and in so doing, we we're able to, in fact, loosen restrictions and open up the economy. Now, I, I, I hasten to add, we've never really restricted too uh, uh, dramatically the economic opportunity of Utah. In fact, we've been listed as the uh, probably the third or fourth least restricted state in America in this process. That being said, we certainly have had a plan in place uh, that we've tried to follow, and we've always said that we have all individual responsibility to follow the plan, to work together to see if we can, in fact, uh, control the growth of the virus. And for three months, it worked very well. Um, I appreciate the work of the people of Utah. But we have found ourselves in kind of a unique place, not unique to other states. 37 other states right now have increasing infection rates in their respective states, all trying to find out, you know, what to do with it and how to deal with it. As I've looked back at our plan, and I would say it still is the most comprehensive, detailed plan of action to help us get through the pandemic of any state in America, has given us good guidance, and as we've adhered to the guidelines, we've done pretty well. One of the mistakes I think that we made is as we identified by the four color coding of uh, red, uh, and then orange, then yellow, and then green, we identified them by risk. 
we said red was high risk, orange was moderate risk, yellow was low risk, and green, the new normal, was really no risk. And I think that's given us probably uh, misinformation as far as what we ought to be doing as people and how we conduct our lives. A better way to have said it, I think, would have been uh, the restrictions. We've loosened the restrictions. We have more restrictions under red, moderate restrictions under orange, low restrictions under yellow, and if we can get to green, virtually no restrictions under the new normal. And so what has happened, I believe, is in this process, as we've got to yellow, and most all the state is now in yellow. Uh, we have the only exceptions of that are really uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, we have some rural counties which are in green, but virtually all the state is in yellow. And what I think people heard when we got to yellow is, ah, low risk. Things are back to almost normal. We don't have to take the same precautions that we've done for these past three months. And uh, again, with summer attractions and family gatherings, the, the holiday seasons, we probably have uh, probably dropped our guard a bit, become a little bit complacent, and really have done things in a social atmosphere that maybe we should have not. Um, for example, we quit wearing masks, at least in the volume that we needed to, and yet we probably should have been wearing masks more often because now we're interacting with our family and friends and neighbors in a more social activity as we've loosened the restrictions. And yet we should have, in fact, maybe tightened the requirements and demands of, in fact, social distancing, making sure we follow proper protocol, uh, not going to work when we're sick, and certainly the wearing of a face covering. Uh, we're finding from uh, the, our science, our medicine, our health care providers, that one of the best ways we can reduce the, the transmission of the coronavirus is, in fact, to wear, wear face coverings. The percentage, the, the likelihood of us transmitting it or catching it go down dramatically if we follow what most of us would think is just a common sense application of protection by wearing a face mask. The concern we have today is that our infection rates uh, have gone up. Uh, today, I think uh, Dr. Dunn announced 585 new cases. Yesterday was 576. Uh, the trend is, is going in the wrong direction. And the concern is the same today as it was back in March when we started on this quest together. If we do not reduce our infection rates, as those infection rates increase, more people will go to the hospital. Uh, more people, then, if they're in the hospital, then be transferred to the ICU units, and that will require more personnel. I'm more concerned about the personnel aspect than I am actually bed space, as we end up having more and more people go to ICU. Uh, that, again, that requires a specialized treatment, and specialized skills, and there's only a finite number of personnel. What we've said in the past is we do not want to have our health sy system overwhelmed because of the COVID-19. Uh, again, we go into the fall and, and traditional flu season, other things that happen, uh, we stand in danger of, in fact, overwhelming the healthcare system. So that uh, trend of 576 or 585 today, uh, on average, of the seven-day rolling average, that's got to change. And we need, in fact, to reduce that. Currently, our system we have in place now allows for local control uh, to have input from our local elected officials who know best what needs to happen in their backyard. And we've uh, been very willing to listen to the requests of local county commissioners and mayors and have them work with their local health department and work with the state health department to make decisions on what should in fact happen as far as policy in those regional areas of the state. As I mentioned, some of the areas have done very well in not having uh, the coronavirus present in, in large amounts, and they've been allowed to go to green. Others, uh, they're still in red, and some have requested to make uh, face mask, face coverings a mandatory requirement. That's true in Salt Lake County, Summit County, 
Grand County and the city of Springdale just outside of Zion Park. That's been a local request which we've granted uh, and, uh, allowing for local control. What we have done at the state level has been if you come and work and participate in our state buildings, we are requiring everybody inside the building to wear, in fact, face coverings, a, a face mask. Again, uh, to make sure that we have a safe environment for our own employees to work, but also a safe environment for our citizens to come and do business with the government. If you go to the DMV, we'd ask you, to, in fact, to wear a mask when you get inside the building. Certainly, if you cannot socially distance, which is defined as six feet apart, two arm lengths, then you should be wearing a mask. It's not that inconvenient, but it can help save you from getting sick and others getting sick, uh, spread the, the coronavirus, and it's going to save some people's lives. Um, so, again, the state building, we've required people to wear face coverings as part of our effort on the government level to, in fact, help slow the spread of the coronavirus. Today, uh, I'm going to add to that. And today, uh, again, as we kind of anticipate, we've had a lot of discussion with people, parents, uh, our teachers, those involved with education, uh, concerned about what do we need to do to open up our school system to get our children back in school. Now, they've missed too much last year. That's been a hardship for many families and individuals, and so we certainly want to make sure we do whatever is necessary to make sure they have a safe environment to go back to school and to learn. Parents should expect that their children are going to a safe environment. Teachers, principals, staff members at the school should, un, uh, should uh, anticipate and expect that they're going to be involved in a safe environment. So to that end, I'm announcing that we are mandating that all students, faculty, staff, and visitors to our K-12 through schools throughout this state, our 41 school districts, our charter schools, will wear a mask in the buildings and on the bus. Uh, this applies to school districts that are even in counties that are green currently. Again, we're going to use an abundance of caution and be proactive in saying we want to make sure that our schools are a safe environment for our children and for those who attend to our children. I expect along with that uh, that our school districts who have a requirement to have a plan in place, so 41 different school districts, 41 plans, they may not all be exactly the same, a lot of similarities, but respecting the unique differences of the location, the size of the school, the demographics that they face with, et cetera, there will be allowed the state uh, or the uh, school principals and superintendents and local school boards to have some flexibility. I recognize that for those in kindergarten, it may be a bigger challenge to wear a mask. We can appreciate that. Maybe first grade, I don't know when the break comes, when it becomes a little easier, but I'll let those people inside the schools and those who have responsibility for the education of these young people, K through 12, to make those kinds of decisions and give them the flexibility they need uh, to the school boards, the principals, and follow their recommendations to make sure that we use common sense application of this mandate to have face masks. I also expect that there's going to be hand sanitizers there available in, in quantity, that there will be opportunities, in fact, for us to have regular hand washing, uh, also the uh, regular opportunities for us, in fact, to wash down flat surfaces with some kind of a disinfectant, Clorox bleach, wash, et cetera, so that, again, we have a clean, sanitary uh, environment for our children to go to school. So that's an announcement of today. Let me also continue on here and say to us as Utahns, uh, we know this is a challenging time. I think everybody appreciates that. Uh, it's unique. It's uncertain. We're learning as we go, and uh, we'll continue to learn. But we're at a somewhat of a crossroads right now uh, as far as, you know, what do we do? Again, our, our infection rates are up. And as I've mentioned, that cannot stand. We've got to, in fact, turn those infection rates around, or our hospital system or healthcare is going to, in fact, become overwhelmed. Uh, we don't want that to happen. I'll explain a little bit more about that in just a minute. But um, right now, uh, we're at 585 a day. 
Uh, our infection rate is at 9.9%. Uh, again, we were down at four, so we've more than doubled our infection rate and we've more than doubled uh, our number of cases that have taken place. So, because of that, I'm going to issue us all a challenge. As Utahns, again, in the spirit of cooperation and collaboration and working together for the common good, as we care about each other, as we should, as neighbors and friends, as we care about our families, as we care about the future uh, for our economic opportunities, we need to do better. And so I'm going to challenge all of us to uh, help do what we need to do to get our average infection rate, or excuse me, our average case rate below 500 by August the 1st. Again, that'll be the month we prepare to get back into school. That's the day that all of our school districts will have to report their plans to open up school in uh, the fall here. Uh, so August 1st would be a good date for us to say, let's see what we can do to change our behavior. Not because government is compelling us to do it, but because it's the right thing to do. I hope we can appreciate that distinction. It may get us to the same result. We maybe need to have guidelines from government to help us understand the urgency. Uh, and not only should we wear a mask, but why we should wear a mask and the science behind it. But let's see if we can't roll up our sleeves and do the right thing for the right reasons. We care about each other. We've demonstrated that in times past. We need to have that same kind of caring today. There is really no excuse for all of us to not wear face coverings and a mask to help protect against the spreading of the coronavirus. The quickest way, I'll just, uh, uh, without making too fine a point on this, the quickest way for us to reduce the rolling average is, in fact, for us to stay home if you're sick. Again, we sometimes are thinking, well, there's low risk, and we start pushing the envelope. If you're sick, stay home. Don't go out. Employers should, in fact, work with your employees to make sure that they don't feel compelled to come in. Find some workarounds. Give some other people opportunities for overtime. But we should not have people going to work while they're sick. Maintain social distancing, particularly when you're indoors. Outdoors is not quite as big of a problem. Uh, we're doing a lot of get gatherings, get together, family socials. And again, let's not let our guard down there. But particularly if you're indoors, you should, in fact, wear a mask. Uh, if you can't social distance, wear a mask. And, and that's really the guidelines. Uh, Indoors, we need to be extra careful and extra cautious because science is telling us that the air circulation there is confined. And we know that the COVID-19 is spread aer with aerosol, the, the vapors of our breath, uh, as we talk, as we uh, sing, as we engage in conversation, as we sneeze, those uh, droplets come out, and that's how the virus is spread. So again, common sense would tell us that we have the uh, opportunity to, to wear a face mask and protect our health and those around us. Um, we have the constitutional authority to mandate this. Certainly working with our state health department, this is an issue that's been tested under the 10th Amendment of the, of the Constitution. The Supreme Court has weighed on this a number of times, saying we have the ability to make this a mandate. At this time, I choose not to make it a mandate. I'm going to give the people of Utah an opportunity to show the kind of people and the character that they are, which I believe we've demonstrated in times past. It's time for us to, in fact, say, you know what, for the good of the whole, we're going to comply voluntarily to wear face coverings. Uh, when we go out and we shop, wear a face cover. I don't care whether it's a grocery store or a retail outlet. Uh, we go to restaurants, and again, those in the business environment should make sure that they do everything they can to instill confidence in the consumer that when they come and shop at my store, that you have a safe environment to participate in. And they need to do their own creativity, innovation, find ways to make that 
known to the to the consumer that uh, this is a safe environment to come and participate in. That's the onus we put on those involved in the business side of this. Uh, we have consensus by many different groups out there that this is wise uh, a protocol for us all to follow. We have in our own state, uh, we have the faith-based organizations who've come together and said we encourage our followers to, in fact, wear a face mask and a, and a, and a practice social distancing and sanitation. But again, the emphasis is on wear a face mask. That's all the churches that I know of, and, and certainly the letter that's gone out signed by uh, many. Secondly, we have the health care industry. Those people who are, that's their job is to help us be well, to help us recover if we get sick. And they are on the front lines of this issue on the coronavirus. And they're saying, it's a good idea you should be wearing a face covering. You should be wearing a mask. And now we've had the business community come out and have said, we too, as a business community at large, say we'd like to have people wear a mask. They are concerned that if we don't, you can understand the entrepreneurs, the business people, and we as consumers, the concern is if we don't, are we going to roll back from yellow to orange? and put more restrictions on the economy as our plan requires and suggests, they would prefer that we don't do that, but that we wear a mask. And I prefer that that's what we do also. So as we move forward, uh, again, I think we have uh, challenges before us. Our goal is over the next uh, two to three weeks to reduce the rolling average down to below 500. That will allow us to ensure that we have capacity with our health care system, that we don't overwhelm it, that we can have good quality health care. That will, in fact, help us to be healthy, to recover quicker, and have less fatalities in the state of Utah. It's just good common sense. It's wisdom that we should practice. Um, if we don't, we all know what the uh, ultimate results of not complying and not being able to, in fact, uh, flatten the curve and reduce the infection rate, we'll have the, uh, un, uh, the disappointing decision of having to make, do we in fact roll back the economy, go from yellow to orange, for example, or mandating the use of masks? Those are the options that are ahead of us. I choose to say, let's let the people, in fact, make those decisions. As I said in the very beginning of this effort, when we came out with the plan, this plan only works if we as individuals take on the responsibility to do our part. If we all do our part, we can in fact conquer this pandemic and slow and stop the spread of this virus and protect the health and welfare of the people we love and, and our uh, friends and, and associates, as well as continue to allow the economy to recover and become the robust number one best economy in America that we had before this pandemic hit. That should be our goal. That should be our efforts as we work together. So let's do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And uh, as we kind of sum up here, I can just tell you, I believe in the people of Utah. There's no greater uh, caring people in America, maybe the world, than the people that live right here and call Utah home. So I believe in you as we work together, wash our hands, wear the mask, put our shoulder to the wheel, push along, push along, all of us working together, we can conquer this. So I appreciate the good work you've done in the past. We need to redouble our efforts now to, to slow down this spread and reduce the rate of infection. We have till August 1st to do that. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Now, Governor, it's Ben Winslow from Fox 13. What is your metric then? You say that you're not ruling out the idea of a statewide mandate. So what's your metric? How bad does it have to get before you potentially consider uh, a mandate or moving us uh, back? We've seen cases increase in recent days. That great question, Ben. Uh, one of the things that I should mention, too, is that we're going to assemble here in the next few days, probably sometime next week, the stakeholders, the, the, uh, the number crunchers, the medical advisors, the scientists, 
and make sure that we understand the data uh, and we're all on the same page interpretation of the data. We have different organizations, not only in state but out of state, that look at our data and draw different conclusions. Uh, that causes me concern. We've got to be on the same page, understanding the data the same and what it informs us to do as we develop policy. Uh, we've worked with the medical people and uh, we believe that there is the ability to get up to 800. But as we get to 800, it's like the wings falling off the plane. Uh, that does not give us the headroom that we probably would want to have, certainly would not be wise to be floating that close to the edge of the cliff. If we have a surge, we would not be able to accommodate it. At 800, that's when we start, in fact, requ uh, requiring no more elective surgery, for example. That impacts the economy. Uh, that puts us back, if you remember, when we start eliminating elective surgery, that's like putting us back into the color of red. So we don't want to wait for that to happen. That's why we've set the goal to get down below 500. We've been there before for most of the time. That's something we can, in fact, do. It's a laudable goal, and uh, we, we will, that's really our, our target point, is to see what we can do in these next two and a half to three weeks to turn this around and say, by August 1st, let's get below uh, 500. If we can't do that, if we don't do that, then that may trigger some more aggressive action by the government. In the meantime, so, Governor, let me finish so up. So, Governor, now. I was just going to ask, what was your uh, decision, your your motive for, for just not implementing a mandate like other states are doing, though? What was the, the trigger point for you to, to not do this? In working in conjunction with the legislature, with the business community, others, uh, we all kind of agreed this is the best thing to try first. We're, the legislature, for example, is going to put a million-dollar grant out for uh, public information, uh, public service announcements, to inform the, the public about why it's important to wear a mask. I don't want this to become a divisive issue, which we already see people out there. Now, maybe that we've got past the, uh, the, the campaigns uh, for governor and others out there. Maybe it will become less politicized, I hope. We don't want to have a divisive situation where people rebel. Uh, I, I, I hope that doesn't happen. So we're saying, okay, you know what? We're to this crossroads. Here's the opportunity for us, the people, to control our destiny without having government come in and mandate. Uh, and so I'm going to try that first, and we'll see what happens. By the way, I was going to mention, you know, we're asking our, those involved, we want to increase our testing numbers, so we're not only calling the people to do better and do more, uh, and uh, be conscious about their habits to help slow the spread of the coronavirus. But those involved in testing, we need to increase our capacity for testing. I would like to see us not only increase the capacity, but also to increase the, the timeliness of it so that you can get tested quickly, uh, easily, and have a result come back in a timely fashion in less than 24 hours. So we're going to be working on that aspect and call upon those involved in that side of our healthcare industry to do what we need to do to help improve our testing capacity and timeliness of getting the results back into the hands of those who get tested. Next question. Hi, uh, thank you and good afternoon, Governor. Uh, you have been encouraging social distancing and wearing masks for some time now. School is not in session. You've encouraged people to wear masks. It hasn't seemed to work. What makes you think it'll work now? Well, as I've looked back, and again, we're learning as we go, as I mentioned earlier, and let me just emphasize that again, we have a great plan in place, and we are now in the fourth iteration of that to help lead us uh, out of the pandemic to have minimal impact on our health and minimum impact on our um, economy. And frankly, if, if we just measure those two points, we've done pretty good. Our fatality rate now is less than 1%. It's at 0.745 uh, of a percent, of the lowest in the nation. Our unemployment rate is at 8.5%, which is the second lowest in the nation. So on those two metrics, we're doing pretty good. I'm concerned about what's going to happen. I want to keep them low, and if this rising rate of infection has caused me concern. 
as I've mentioned, I think in looking back of where we've been and what we've done and what we should have done better is in labeling the, uh, the red, orange, yellow, and green, not as far as high risk, moderate risk, low risk, and no risk. We should have said they all have risk. And we've certainly said with our vulnerable populations that it's still red for you guys. There's a risk out there. And what we did not anticipate is that people would change their behaviors and be a little more casual and cavalier. I get reports all the time of we've had these holiday seasons where family gatherings, people are not practicing social distancing. They're not wearing a face mask. We've become a little bit complacent and lackadaisical. And I'm saying we can't do that. We've got to reverse that trend and say, let's take it seriously. We've got to do our part. Certainly until we get a vaccine, we're going to have to, in fact, have this become a more normal part of our life, wearing a mask when we, in fact, cannot social distance, and particularly when we're indoors. So that's what's informed me to say, you know what, uh, we've made some mistakes here. That's probably allowed people to not uh, wear the mask and take it probably as seriously as we're now interfacing with each other uh, on many levels more than we did here just a couple of months ago. Next question. Hi, Governor. Uh, this is Jacob Klopfenstein with KSL.com. Uh, just a quick clarification, and then I did have one other question. Um, a few minutes ago when you were answering uh, Ben Winslow's question, you made a uh, mention that uh, the, the health care folks have said we can get up to 800. Um, is that referring to that seven-day rolling average? Yes. Uh, we can okay. get up to 800. Again, it, it's, uh, I think it's dangerously, dangerously close to the edge of the cliff, and I, don't, I would not want to get to that point. Um, I think we're learning as we go how we can, in fact, increase capacity uh, and different things that we're taking uh, place. I think people are learning more how to, uh, to uh, deal with the COVID-19 when you get it. It appears to be, and we need to check the data on this, I, there is at least a theory that the, the, the people are having less severe reaction to the COVID-19, which leads to less time in the hospital for those who need it. Uh, and so there may be some information in the data. That's one of the things I want, why I want to get together next week with the stakeholders and start a new, a fresh look at the data and see what it informs us to do making sure that we're all on the same page and agree with, one, the, the data, the facts, and what that means, the trends, and what it, it means as far as the outcomes, and, and three, what we should be doing about it as policymakers. So um, uh, that, that's really the situation we find ourselves in today, and, and I, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I'm optimistic we're going to do the right thing and continue the trend of keeping uh, livelihoods and lives intact. And right now we've done that, but I, I'm concerned about if we don't make some addressing now, take a, take a hard stance now in addressing this in a forthright manner, even though we're saying it's still not mandated to wear masks, that could be in the future. So this is an opportunity for us, to, in fact, to roll up our sleeves and do the right thing for the right reasons, which I think the people of Utah will do. Okay, uh, thank you. And then I, I do have one other question. This one might be better for uh, Dr. Dunn. Um, so obviously, as we're talking about mask mandates, uh, we've had one, you know, here in Salt Lake County uh, for a couple of weeks now. Um, and, you know, we've heard over and over that, you know, wearing masks is, is a proven way of stopping the spread of COVID. Um, but I, I guess we're still seeing cases go up pretty dramatically in Salt Lake County. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering what the, what the difference is there and, you know, how you anticipate, um, you know, the mask mandate in Salt Lake County and the other areas that have, have instituted one, how, how you expect that to uh, help stop the spread as we move forward. Yeah, so I think with, with any policy change, it actually takes a few weeks, if not a month, for us start, to start seeing the result of that policy in our numbers. Um, and so we're, that's something we're watching closely for all of those counties, um, especially Salt Lake County, given their high number of cases and looking at the case rates. Um, we have some, seen some good evidence that their rates have started to you know, not climb as steeply as they have in the past. Um, but again, the next week or so will be really telling um, on the to tell us if the impact of the um, mask mandate is what we had hoped.
You know, let me just add, that's part of the challenge we face here in developing policy is that there is a lag time. And it's hard to identify here's the cause and here's the effect. It takes some time to do that analysis. And sometimes it's hit and miss and sometimes it's a nuanced difference. Um, and we have gatherings that take place because of holidays, so summer vacation. We've had protesters downtown Salt Lake. I mean, there's a lot of different variables out there that kind of uh, kind of confuse the issue. But the lag time is really one of the hardest things for us to analyze. That's why I want to see what happens over these next three weeks with a renewed emphasis on us all wearing the mask at appropriate times when we cannot social distance. And let's see what the numbers end up being then. I appreciate the fact that Dr. Dunn has indicated that it does look like maybe we have a plateau. Uh, it's a higher plateau, which is not good, but the plateau, if we could plateau, that's a good thing. So our goal is to reduce it to below 500 uh, on average per day. If we do that, that will declare some great success and we're moving in the right direction. Next question. Can you hear me? Okay, hear me? Aaron, Aaron, we can hear you. Go ahead, Aaron. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is probably a question for Dr. Dunn. Uh, I was told by a healthcare provider that yesterday their system instructed them not to test patients until five days after symptom onset in order to prevent false positives. And I'm wondering, you know, first, is that the norm now for testing? And two, how prevalent have false negatives been? your knowledge and three if this is something everyone is doing should we anticipate new reporting lags to mean i guess an artificial drop in new cases and also that this this new weight could deter infected people from getting tested at all because like they'll get used to not knowing accepting the risk of transmission they're not going to be willing to isolate for five days when they really don't have any earthly idea whether they have coronavirus or not um that's my that's my question Sure, thanks, Aaron. So um, if anybody has symptoms, no matter how mild, we recommend getting tested immediately. Um, and that's through the nasal pharyngeal swab or the swab through your nose. And that tells you if you have an active infection. Um, if someone has symptoms, the chances of a false positive are very, very low. It's a really good test. Um, so, so I'm unsure of the anecdote that, um, that you it explained. Was they, they said the viral load was inadequate in the early days of the illness to produce a sure. positive. Sure. Generally, if someone's already showing symptoms, though, they have enough virus for the um, test to be very accurate. And so we as a state and same with our healthcare partners have not recommended waiting if you have symptoms. But I'll certainly check into that um, to that anecdote. What we do recommend that is if you're a close contact to somebody who has coronavirus um, and you don't have symptoms yet, you should wait around five to seven days before getting tested if you have no symptoms. And that's because the average incubation period is five days and you don't want a false negative at that point. But again, that's only for people who don't have symptoms. So if you're a close contact and you've had no symptoms, waiting five to seven days is prudent. But if you have symptoms, um, you should get tested. Thank you. Let me just conclude again, thanking everybody for their participation today. We thank the media. I know there's a lot going on, important issues out there besides the, the pandemic. But the pandemic is really a top issue because it's going to be with us for a long time. And we've got to figure out how we're going to address this as a community at large. In fact, to make sure that we protect ourselves and our loved ones from this coronavirus. At the same time, making sure that our economy stays healthy and functioning, which is a big important part of each one of our lives. So again, I would just encourage the people of Utah to show your love, your respect, your concern for your fellow man, your neighbor, your family members by wearing the mask. It's not a hard thing to do. It's probably the least inconvenient thing we could ask you to do on a, such a difficult situation. It certainly is cost effective and the most effective way to help slop, stop and slow the spread of the coronavirus. So let's all pull together by wearing the mask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor and Dr. Dunn. This will conclude the briefing for today. We also appreciate our American Sign Language interpreters and our Spanish interpreters uh, who have helped 
been helping get this message out to as many Utahns as possible. Thank you, and we'll talk to you next week.